chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, uh, while you're turning to Matthew 7, I figured I'd go ahead and give you a little more context. Uh, Brother Lance sent me a video, uh, if you remember, I worked with him at the military prison there in Washington, and uh, was actually his backup if he had, was traveling or whatever, so um, I had a intimate knowledge of the prison, and so he sent me a video, and uh, so I can see the new one and see what they're doing. It's a $83 million project, and um, it's, it, it's amazing, all state of the art. And when I was there, it was the old school magnet, big heavy magnet locks for all the cells and the gates. And I would go and I would check in, and then you just hear this <laughs> the clunking sound. It was the magnet releasing the door. I would go in, and once it shut behind me, then I could hear it click, and then I walk down the hallway, and you know you're standing there on the camera, and they can see who it is, and they, it's just that constant clanging and clacking, and yeah, it was pretty rudimentary to say the least. But uh, new one looks great. Uh, the layout looks great. We didn't have a designated chapel before. Um, they had kind of a uh, garage that had been kind of converted into um, just kind of a general purpose space next to the prison laundry and uh, so we just made it work chairs and whatnot but uh, this new one actually has a chapel it has a chapel it has designated counseling spaces um, so it's really it really is pretty I can't wait to see it so Lord willing Easter time I'll be able to go back for the Easter revival and uh, and see it. So, Lord willing, we'll see. But uh, it looks really good. So, but pray for him. Um, Miss Chris, Christy is doing much better. Um, she's recovered. She did travel with him to the conference, um, and they're back. They're fine. She plans on going with him this month to Idaho. So, she's doing much better. Um, so, at any rate. Uh, just figured I'd give you a little bit more context that we didn't have in the letter, but uh, uh, thank you, Miss Cherry, also for your willingness to read those every week. I don't know about y'all, I like it. I don't always, so I read them when I get them, and I don't always periodically stop by to read them. Now, I put them up there so that we could read them, but really the reason I, I hung those in the foyers just for that constant reminder, right, that we're serving, that we are a part of, of men and women serving the Lord in various parts of the world. Um, and so I acknowledge that we probably just get used to it being there, but I want to encourage you to not. Um, and read those letters every now and then. I've got, I put six of them up today. Um, I had a bunch, I had six of them come in this week, and so they're up, they're updated, and uh, I'll get some new ones um, here shortly, I'm sure. So, all right, Matthew 7, Matthew 7, tonight we have come to a new chapter in our study, the final study where we've been all year. This is the only thing we've done other than guest preachers or Brother Eduardo in 2022. This is all I've done on Sunday evenings, Sermon on the Mount. Um, but it has been good. I don't know if it's been good for you all, but it's been good for me all. And um, I, I've really enjoyed it. So this is, it, it was a study that I've wanted to do for quite some time. Uh, so I was super excited. But tonight we've come to a new chapter, chapter 7 of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but even though it's a new chapter, really it's just a continuation of the thoughts of Jesus. Uh, we've seen him already, uh, we've seen, uh, we've considered and discussed, I should say, many practical subjects that deal with human life and the practice uh, in our study time, and, uh, and we're going to continue to see what we've seen all along, okay, nothing's really going to change. Just by way of an administrative note, remember, chapter, di chapter verse divisions were added to help us in locating key elements of Scripture, okay? So, uh, don't get caught up in chapter, okay? We're, we're still, nothing really is going to change, and you're going to see that. 
So Jesus is not doing anything different. Tonight we actually get to a few verses that I believe will be extremely helpful for heritage moving forward as we, as a, one, as a reminder, and two, uh, as we begin uh, pushing forward and seeing new faces and getting out there and interacting, I think this is going to be really helpful. So I'm going to ask you if you are willing and able to stand with me this evening in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to begin reading in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 7. The Bible says, Jesus is still speaking, and Jesus says, Judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thy own eye. Thou, say it with me, hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thy own eye, and then, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Look at what Jesus says here. And you kind of have to remember, part of uh, observing Scripture is, is putting yourself in the text, right? So think about this. Students, I hope you caught that. Think about this, okay? So think about you being here. Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye. Then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Think about Jesus' tone of voice here and how it might change and just the kind of the sarcastic amazement, like what is wrong with you? And I really believe that it will be helpful tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask Him to be with our study, and we'll get right into it. Father, we thank You for another opportunity to gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ uh, in this place. Father, we thank You for the freedom to do so. Lord, thank You for uh, those in attendance who are committed to serving You and to uh, drawing closer to You and taking time from their day to worship You. Father, we ask that you would be with the time in your word this evening. We ask that you would uh, do something very special in our hearts and our minds this evening that would draw us closer to you. Father, help us to understand this passage. Uh, Lord, it is a very uh, very commonly argued passage, as you know. Father, we ask that you would just help us tonight to uh, better understand so that we may find ourselves uh, able to be obedient. Father, I need your help. I ask that you would give me the compassion and the zeal necessary to present your word in a way that would bring honor to you this evening. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time of worship. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Jesus spoke these words some 200 years ago. And yet they're still fresh. They're still relevant. They're still real. They're still needful. Just as much today as they were then. I want to remind us that Jesus is dealing with real issues that his society faced. And these issues remain today. There's nothing new under the sun, as they say. Okay? Nothing new. There are those who claim that God's word is somehow outdated. I don't know about you, but I find that to be a hard argument because it's still sufficient. Uh, we're still dealing with very much the same thing, so I don't know how it could be outdated. Many claim that it's archaic or no longer relevant. Again, I don't understand because I see a whole lot of relevance. I personally am convinced that the Bible is not obsolete or obsolete, but in fact, absolute. It is all we need. The truths that Jesus spoke here are just as relevant and needful today as they have ever been. Society and cultures may change, but our Lord does not. The people of Jesus' day face difficulties. They face temptations. But they're the difficulties and the temptations that you and I face. There's nothing new. And our text tonight focuses on judging others. Yay, one of a pastor's favorites. Whether we like to admit it or not, church, we all make judgments. 
practically every day. Some are quick. Some are subtle. Others are more deliberate. They're more obvious. So I want us to think about some things tonight as we think about judgment. But really what I want us to consider tonight is the facts about judgment as revealed to us by Christ. So we could put it this way, judgment is on trial tonight. And so we want to hear what the judge has to say. Are you following me? Kind of setting the thought process here. The title of the message this evening is The Verdict on Judgment. The Verdict on judgment. First and foremost, I want to make sure that you understand this is a portion of scripture that is so often misinterpreted and wrongfully applied. How do we normally hear this? We normally get verse 1 by itself. Judge not, lest ye be judged. That's what we hear people say. Oh, you Christians, all you do is judge people. Doesn't the Bible say judge not, lest you be judged? No, it does. Okay, then, well, And then when you try to give them context, they just don't want to hear. So really what they're doing is saying, we don't want you to tell us that we're wrong. The Bible says you shouldn't tell me when I'm wrong. And actually what the Bible does tell us to do is actually to judge. You're like, but pastor, it just said judge not. No, no, we are actually commanded to judge. Sin. Do you know that? That's scriptural. As, as men and women of God, you have the responsibility to call sin, sin. And the only way that you can call sin, sin is to judge. Now, there's a difference between biblical, what Jesus is referring to here is in judging, and being judgmental. When the world says, the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged, they're talking about being judgmental. And we are not to be judgmental. Make sense? But we still are commanded to judge. And Jesus is going to explain some of this. You say, Pastor, I don't see it. Well, good. I'll show it to you. Okay? I'll show it to you. Within the admonition of Christ, we find two key elements that we need to consider. Number one, that in his admonition... There's a distortion that's taking place, okay? Judge not, that you be not judged. (sighs) I'm sure we've heard this quoted many times by people who've been confronted with sin and questionable behavior, right? And you get it, it's common, you know it's there. People say things like, how dare you judge me? People say things like, does your Lord not teach that you're not to judge others? But I want to tell you this, if a pastor or Christian takes a stand against sin, especially in public rebuke, you are going to be accused of judging one another. Again, we have to take a stand against sin. That is judging. But there are conditions that must be met. There are some things that we need to be reminded of, and that's what I want us to unpack tonight. The fact of the matter is this, is I have no real way of knowing the true spiritual condition of each and every person that I meet. None. And so I would never declare that an individual could not possibly be saved because of their actions. I have no clue. How many of you know somebody who claims to be born again, but you don't see any evidence of their salvation anybody okay that's what we're not supposed to do well pastor i thought i thought that you just said no 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 no. our spirits will bear witness but we talked about it a little bit this morning remember there's going to be an element of holy spirit indwelling there's going to be an element. And I think it's important that we understand that if, if somebody accepts Christ their Savior, but there's no discipleship, there's no follow-up teaching, there's no uh, uh, assimilation into a local church, how can we expect them to grow? Think about it this way. 
When we talk about judging people, we don't know their eternal state. Would you agree? True or false, we do not know someone's eternal state. True. Would you agree, though, that our spirits bear witness and there's, there, then we, there's always going to be an element of spiritual, the work of the Holy Spirit, evident in their life? Is, is there an element of that? Sure. So I want you to understand it this way. When somebody gets saved, would you, okay, let's take it, put it this way. When you got saved, did it, did you change instantaneously? So why do you expect others to? Can't. When you got saved, did it take time? Was it a process? So why aren't you allowing them to have time or there be a process? Well, Pastor, there's just things about so-and-so that you just don't know. You're right. There are things that I don't know. And by the way, there's things about so-and-so that you don't know. We've got to be careful when it comes to judging someone's salvation. That's what I want to make sure that we understand. We do not have the right nor the ability to declare somebody saved or unsaved based solely upon their actions. Now, when our spirits bear witness, what are, we, what are we oftentimes referring to? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, Jonah's goodness, faith, meekness, hope. Right? There's evidence of those things. Well, what is evidence of those things? Well, one person to another, it could be drastically different. I'm trying to illustrate right now how dangerous it can be for us to question or judge one another's salvation, but that's where it begins. We have to make sure that we understand we're not declaring someone's salvation. What we're talking about when we talk about judging, what we talk about is that the Bible mandates and dictates that we are to judge. That is to judge sin. What we're seeing here is that we cannot judge salvation. Look, don't base, Jesus is saying, don't base somebody's salvation and belief in me based off of what you see because there's things that you got going on in your life that they don't see either that if they knew about, they would be able to question your salvation. That's what Jesus is saying. He's not talking about us not judging sin. He's talking about us judging salvation. Judging his followers. I mean, I mean, let's just see what the Bible says. Uh, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy... What is that word? Say it again. Who's I? Unsaved people are not your brother. Pastor, I never saw that before. Yeah, because this is one, arguably one of the most misinterpreted passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. Words mean things. Jesus said, your brother's eye. So Eduardo, he was talking to guys like me and you. So, I'm supposed to judge your sin. True? Call you out on it. Exhort you. Not your salvation. How many of you are like, I've never heard it that way? Be honest. That's the problem. That's why God brought you Pastor Paul. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> but it's the truth. I just showed it to you. The word is brother. You know how many looks I was getting before I revealed that to you? It was awesome. I was like, Lord, help me because I'm fixing to get it. They're fixing to run me out of here. Because I said we're not supposed to judge people. Right? No, no. I said we're, not, we're supposed to judge people. Their sin. We're supposed to call sin, sin. That's the essence of taking a stand. Is we have to say, hey, brother, you got some sin in your life. Let's fix it. And I don't just beat him up for it. We go and we kneel down and we pray together. Brother Eric, let's talk, buddy. I mean, you just, it seems like there's some things going on. Everything okay? Well, let, let's work through this. Let's pray, right? There's, there's some things that this isn't you, brother. And so on and so forth, right? 
We're supposed to call sin, sin. And then it looks like you're sitting here with these looks on your face like, but pastor, Jesus just said judge not. But it's about salvation. He's talking about judging your brothers. Well, who are our brothers? Those who are brothers in Christ, right? Those who are born again. That's why I say we have no way of understanding someone's spiritual condition, and that's what Jesus is referring to. Okay, Judge not that you be not judged. Look, it is not your place, Mark, to judge someone's salvation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Here the word prove has the idea of to test or examine, scrutinize, to prove or deem worthy. Do you think we need to prove some things? Well, yeah, that's, that's our Spirit's bearing witness. There will always be proof or evidence of Holy Spirit convicting and Holy Spirit having the freedom to work in somebody's life. And understand this, that the Holy Spirit's not working in the life of somebody who, to whom the Holy Spirit doesn't indwell. So these are two separate people. So when people come to you and say, the Bible says you're not to judge. Well, I'm afraid you've been lied to. Because when Jesus said that, he was saying not to judge our brothers. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I'm sorry, friend, you're not my brother. So God actually commands that I tell you that you're sinning. You will flip the world upside down. But that's taking a stand. We're talking to, Jesus is talking to disciples. So we have to stay in the context of disciples. So everybody good on that. I want to make sure you understand the difference here. We judge sin. But we do not judge salvation. We don't. Because who are you to know whether or not somebody has placed their faith and trust in Jesus? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11, the Bible says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Call them out. The unfruitful works of darkness. So, so unfruitful, there's no fruit. Of wickedness. The unfruitful works of wickedness, wi wickedness reprove them. Take a stand against the sin. We talked about it this morning. Sin is always the root issue. Yeah, somebody's being hateful or ugly or prideful, arrogant, whatever, whatever sin you want to throw on it, whatever is manifesting, that's fruit of something else. The fruit of, the, the lack of fruit is, the lack of spiritual fruit, right, is evidence of wicked fruit. Well, what is wicked fruit? The manifestation of sin. It is when our iniquity, the inward things, the inward part of sin, is when our iniquity, the fruit of wickedness, is when our iniquity becomes transgression. Does it make sense? It's really good. I'm getting excited. John chapter 7, verse 24. The Bible says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The only thing that can be, be adequately judged is sin. That's it. That's it. That's all we can judge is sin. We can't judge or the apparent lack of fruit does anybody know someone who claims to be born again and but would say pastor there is absolutely zero fruit zero evidence anybody know somebody like that and i bet you i bet you if you would step back in light of what Jesus said in these five verses and you actually examine their life i guarantee you at some point if they made a profession of faith, at some point you would say, you know what, I have seen. They're not who they once were. Maybe they're not who you think they should be, but that's doing exactly what Jesus is exhorting us to not do. Just because somebody doesn't look how you think they're supposed to look, or just some, because somebody doesn't act the way you think they're supposed to act, or just because somebody's not doing what you think they're supposed to do, does not mean they're not born again. They've got to work out their own salvation, and I don't remember anybody dying and making you boss. Judge not, lest ye be judged. 
Something to think about, isn't it? An old, pu- old preacher used to say, I may not be a judge, but I can be a fruit inspector. But I think that's good. It's not my job. It's not your job to evaluate somebody's life and say, man, they're not born. How many... (laughs) I'm trying not to get angry. How many of you ever heard this? How could somebody who's saved do that? That's what Jesus is saying, don't do. You're judging them. You want to know how they can do it? They're sinners. Just like you. Well, well, Pastor, you, I just don't understand how they could do it. I don't understand how you could understand or know that Jesus said not to judge salvation and turn around and judge salvation. Now we're just in this vicious cycle of attacking one another. And that's not even part of what Jesus is talking about here. But it came up. It worked its way in. It's, there's just so many problems with it. Judge sin. Take a stand. Stand for right. We have to stand for truth. Thus saith the Lord God Almighty. We have to say that. But we have no business determining who is born again. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. So Jesus offers this word of caution here, right? He says, be careful. He says that we are to be just in our evaluations. We pass judgment in a faulty or deceptive manner. We can expect to receive the same. So think about that. Judge not, lest ye be judged. For with whatever judgment ye judge, you'll be judged that same way. You better make sure it's not wrong. Because with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. It better not be faulty. It better not be deceptive. So what's he doing? He's saying be very careful when it comes to judging the salvation of your brother. That's between me and him. And when you start jumping in and trying to say that he's not my child or I haven't saved him, now you're calling me a liar. So you might want to watch it. You're picking a fight with Jesus is what you're doing. Now imagine this, right? Because we talk about standing before him and giving account to how we gave, used our lives in service to him, right? And it is our desire as a church to hear him say, well done, now good and faithful. And we all come in together, right? I mean, that, now imagine him saying, well done, thou good and faithful, enter into my kingdom. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into my kingdom. And you're getting up there and you're next. And he's like, I got a problem with you. Look behind you. You look behind you. Your eyes get this big. Why are your eyes that big, Paul? Well, Lord, I, I didn't know they were saved. Yeah, you told them they weren't. Step aside, son. Next person comes up. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into my kingdom. Think about this now. Put yourself in there. Just think about how this can unfold. How, how is it going to, how, do you want to stand before your Savior one day and hear him say, step aside, we need to talk? Not this guy. Now, I'm sure we're all going to have to have that conversation, unfortunately, because we mess up. But you get the idea here. Who are you to say that I didn't save so-and-so? Well, Lord, you don't understand. There wasn't any fruit. Oh, yeah? Do you know what they were like before me? Well, well, actually, I do, Lord. Okay, so you didn't notice that they went from cussing and screaming and being angry to just not angry? Sounds to me like that's peace. Love, joy, peace. Yeah, but it was, it, it, Lord, I mean, it was, that could have been age. It could have been, no, no, no. Do you not understand what I did? Do you not understand how I worked? Do you not understand that this person used to be violent and now they're not? How dare you say 
that they weren't born again. You think they just became less violent because of themselves? I did that. You see the problem here? And so now the tables turn, and now Jesus looks at you and he says, so let's talk about you for a minute since you want to point the finger at everybody else. My point, the point I'm trying to make here, church, is that we have to use some discernment. We must understand what Jesus is saying here. We must understand that God expects us to detest sin. But we're to love that person. The one committing sin. Many in Jesus' day were able to find fault in other people. I mean, that's just the nature of the law, right? I mean, the law pointed out your failures. Well, that's the beautiful thing about grace. Is it covers them. Where the law exposed failure and sin, grace covers it. Doesn't hide it. It covers it. A lot of people were quick to pass judgment and never realized that that same judgmental spirit would be returned towards them. It's dangerous to pass that type of judgment. It's dangerous, church. Look at verse 3. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? There's two aspects that require attention. Okay, first we need to look at the objects being talked about, okay? Jesus is talking about two men, each of which have an object in their eye, something obstructing their view, something in their life that is not help that is causing them to not see well. Make sense? One is a moat, the other is a beam. Okay? The a moat could be defined as a chip or a splinter. The beam would then would be a board. Or a log. <laughs> Something that that splinter came off of. So it's interesting to discover that the mode is the same material as the beam. It's just small. So clearly we see that both of these obstructions are the same nature. But one is much larger than the other. Right? Are you with me? It's bigger. So I think it's safe to say that. We have to deal with obstructions to our own spiritual view before we're able to deal with the whatever it may be obstructing our brother's view. Are, right? That's what Jesus is saying. You need to be careful about judging. What's you know the old saying? Um, how about you people that live in glass houses? Shouldn't throw stones. It's dangerous, right? Or how about you clean off your own back porch before you start sweeping off mine? Those are biblical precepts. It's moat and beam. And Jesus is, remember he's talking to brothers, so he's talking about brothers in Christ. It's brothers. I don't know how we mess this up. Why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that's in thine own eye? It'd be like me coming up to Brother Mike and Brother Eduardo, I mean, like, and he comes to me, he's like, Pastor, I just, I'm really struggling. I mean, Brother Mike this, Brother Mike that, Brother Mike this, Brother Mike that. And he's just, and I'm, well, here's what Jesus is doing. Eduardo, why are you holding on to that little splinter in his life? Well, well, that's not a splinter. Yeah, but I'm God. So I say how big it is. You don't. So you're blowing this something in his life, this sin in his life, you're blowing it way out of proportion. To me, it's just a small sliver. Because we've already handled it. Why would you hold on to that little thing, that little thing that you're blowing way out of proportion when you've got this log sticking out of your face? You need to fix what's in your life, son. Don't worry about what's in his life because that's not a big deal. And here's why it's not a big deal. Because he took care of that problem. We're working on that problem. Your problem? You haven't come to me about once. How many of you say, Pastor, this is a totally different view of these verses. Praise the Lord. I'm glad. 
Because that's what's going on. I'm showing you from the word. God saying it, not me. What is he saying here? Don't be giving advice to other people when you're not willing to take your advice. I went to Brother Mark a few weeks ago about something. And <clears throat> several weeks ago about something. And he gave me some counsel. That's what deacons do, right? Just kind of help steer the pastor a little bit when he's distracted. No big deal. It's, hey, that's, what, that's the relationship. It wasn't, what, two or three days later, he came to me and I said, what did you tell me three days ago? He said, oh, yeah. We need to make sure that we're not encouraging or teaching or admonishing someone else to do something we haven't done ourselves. We need to address the beam sticking out of our face. I mean, think about it. Jesus says it's a little problem. Yeah, it's sin, but we're handling it. Sin is sin, and Jesus isn't evaluating sin here. He, what he's doing is he's helping the disciples to understand that what that splinter is something that a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ is already in the process of taking care of. That's between them and God. And that we need to let them work out their own salvation. But if we, we've probably got something in our eye that's sticking out of our whole face. It's not a small piece of. It's the whole board. The whole law. We need to pay attention. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that's in thine own eye? Why do you have the sight to see what's in your brother's eye, but don't have the understanding or the, the attentiveness to recognize what's in your own face? Being, being, this is where it becomes being judgmental. It's super easy, isn't it? To point out everybody else's faults. We hate. Our own pointed out. I called one of my dear, a man that I love, a man I'm praying about coming in the spring and doing our revival. He was one of my professors. He was a pastor, a missionary pastor in Ireland for many years. Wife got sick. They had to move back. Um, just brilliant, brilliant mind. He's a doctor of theology. But I was spending some time with the Lord Wednesday morning and and just trying to navigate through some things. Just me and God. And I just felt led of the Holy Spirit to call this brother. So I called him up. He's like, Paul, what are you doing? It's good to hear from you. He's like, oh, I'm doing okay. He goes, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean? He's like, you wouldn't have called me. Not when you should be getting ready for services. It's Wednesday. And I said, well, I, I, I'm almost done. And he says, so what's going on? I started crying. Shared my heart with him a little bit. And he said, uh, got a question for you. He started asking me a question. And I was like, ugh. He asked me another question. I was like, ugh. And he asked me another question. I was like, ugh. And I kept answering his questions. I was being honest. He never asked for details, and he didn't judge me. You see, we have a responsibility to talk to one another, ask them questions, investigate, love them enough to point them back to Jesus. But what Jesus is talking about here is changing the way we treat them based off of their sin. And doing it when we've got unconfessed sin in our life. That's really what it boils down to. It boils down to the confessed sin or unconfessed sin. Jesus, look what Jesus says uh, uh, in verse 4. Or wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in the... Are you going to go to him and give him advice and tell him what to do? But you're not even willing to address that issue in your life. 
I would encourage every one of you in here to do something. And I want you to tell me before you leave tonight if you're willing to commit to doing that. I want you to call up a brother or sister in, uh, in, at Heritage. And I want you to ask them to be your accountability partner. An accountability partner. Somebody that you just, you get with once a week and you pray. I've got a phone call to a pastor right now asking if he'll be my accountability partner. Just keep me straight. Because there are things that the church just does not need to know. It could affect church dynamics, right? There are struggles that a pastor has that a church is not going to understand without thinking bad of the pastor. And so to avoid that situation, my accountability needs to be somebody who understands the struggles of, that a pastor goes through, right? I mean, that makes sense. Now, I can be your accountability partner, but you can't be mine. Okay? Um, there's actually one person I'm thinking about right now that probably could be my accountability partner, and he's in the front. My point is this, is I want you, I want you to go to a brother or sister, same gender, okay? <laughs> girls are girls here, boys are boys here, okay? Go to someone and ask them to be your accountability partner. As an accountability partner, it's not, it's just somebody that you touch base with. Get to know somebody. And I would, I would submit to you that if we did that, and we did a better job of that collectively, we probably would be able to avoid this thing that Jesus is telling us to avoid in judging each other. Be transparent with, the, with one another. You know how many times I've had somebody come up to me and say, Pastor, you shouldn't have told the whole church that. Why? Well, they might think less of you. I want you all to know that I'm just a normal guy. And that I struggle with stuff just like you struggle with stuff. The only difference between me and you is God said, hey, go pastor Heritage. And what he told you was go be Heritage. That's the only difference. Follow me? There are, now, we don't need to know each other the details of what's going on. We don't. But we need to encourage one another. And that's what Jesus is saying. Look, this doesn't make sense. You'll go to your brother and you'll, you'll seek out advice and you'll, you'll try to help him get that little thing in his life out of his life, but you won't even attack the major things in your own life. Maybe, maybe we need accountability partners. Maybe we need a brother or sister in our life who will say, hey, going on with you you're not acting like yourself I went to brother Mike several months ago a long time ago it might have even been like a year ago and all I said to him is I didn't know what was going on and I said brother you're not yourself man what's going on nothing I said okay brother I said okay he came to me about what a week later and you're like pastor God showed me I was not myself I didn't pick out what it was I just hey is everything okay you're you're not yourself well pastor that's your job no I'm pretty sure Jesus is saying that's our job well how do you say that because he's talking about judging yeah that's the opposite of judging so if he says don't judge one another that means we need to exhort one another we need there's something we need to do but it is our tendency to want to fix everybody else. Church, I love you. You know I love you. Anybody doubt that I love you? Be honest. Everybody here say, yes, Pastor, I know that you love us. Everybody, you, okay. So let me tell you this. Let me ask you this. Are you unwilling to yank that beam out of your face? If you are, we need to set up some time that's been together this week look what, how Jesus addresses the person who won't address the sin in their life watch this verse 5 thou hypocrite 
You know all the things to say, but you don't know how to do it. How many of you like hypocrite? Nobody does. Jesus says, you're such a hypocrite. You're two-faced. How about you first cast that beam out of your own eye? Then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Look, if we've got something going on in our life, if we've got a beam sticking out of our spiritual eye and our view is clouded, we can't see properly, how can we help a brother or sister properly? You can't. Because you can't see what's going on. You want to know why you doubt people's salvation? Sin in your life. We circled all the way back to the beginning. You see that? That's why we judge the way we judge. That's why we look at brothers and sisters in Christ and say, I don't, I mean, I just don't think they're saved. I don't understand how they could do that. You got sin in your camp. You got a beam in your eye. Let them work out their own salvation. I've said it twice now. Let them work out with the Lord the things they need to work out. Don't be a hypocrite. Fall on your face. Humble yourself. Submit yourself to a holy God who saved you once and can save you again. Kneel before Him. Throw whatever that beam is at His feet. As a matter of fact, think about it this way. It's kind of interesting that he used this in Matthew chapter 7 because we get to the end of the chapter. He's on a tree for you. And he's saying, get it out of your eye. It's clouding your view. You have no clue of what's going on. You, I would submit to you this, church, that we, you don't know Jesus if you don't understand these five verses. Pastor, how can you say that? Why? Because of this. Did Jesus die for us? Yeah. Was the cross that he bore, that cross member, was it cut for him? No. Remember, those were custom fitted. So you would take somebody, if I was the one that was sentenced to be crucified, they would measure me and cut the cross member. Now I'm going to pick on Brother Xavier because he's the shortest man in here, I think. Well, Brother Mark is, but he's in the back. Come up here and stand in front of me if you would. I want you to see this. So I'll be Barnabas, and he can be Jesus. Now we don't know. I just want you to see something. <laughs> okay, so stand in front of me with your hands out. Just facing. Nope, facing them. So there's Jesus. So let's think about this cross member that was cut for Jesus. Now let's say, other way around. You see the difference here? It's drastic. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Now you didn't get to see it, so you'll have to watch the video later. But, but we were what? This far, this much difference? My arms were this much longer. That, P, that cross member was cut for somebody else. That cross member being cut for Barabbas symbolized that Jesus was not being crucified because of his wrongdoing. He was being crucified because of somebody else's wrongdoing, and somebody else's wrongdoing was us. So the cross member that Jesus literally fell under the weight of belonged to you and belonged to me. I would submit that that's what he's telling us to get out of our stinking eye. All that sin that I went to the cross for? All of that sin that I was scourged for, all of that sin that I was crucified for, all of that sin that caused me to be, be forsaken by the Father, that was for you. And then you had the audacity to look at a brother and look at her sister and say, how could they be saved and still act like that? You're, you just took the cross and threw it back on. You just threw me back on it. How about you let me be God? Is that wisdom? No. What is wisdom? It's the ability to apply knowledge in our lives. 
if we're going to live lives that honor the Lord, if we're going to be proper disciples of Jesus, church, we need to take care of ourselves first. How many of you would say, Pastor, my life is where it needs to be right now? I Nothing. Everything. It's out on the table. I don't have any sin in my life. No. I'm good. I arrived. No, you can't. So why are we... Why do we judge one another? Now, I didn't say that we shouldn't exhort them. We should exhort them. But we need to make sure that we're going to Him with our problems first. Does that make sense? Are you with me, church? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And then... Thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat of thy brother's eyes. Your life must be in order if you are going to help others. There's a lot of things that we should avoid. And I want to encourage you to read through and just really unpack and really meditate on these five verses. Will you do that for me this week? Just meditate on it. It is possible to make an accurate evaluation. Sorry. It is impossible to make an accurate evaluation of what is taking place when your vision is clouded by your own sin. How many of you want to see heritage be used by God in a mighty way? I know you do. I believe you. And he is. <laughs> Believe me, he is. But we need to take care of sin in our own life. And stop worrying about what God's doing in big picture. We can't get saved for somebody else, so we can't get right with the Lord for somebody else either. And we need to stop living that way. And I'm not saying we are, I'm just understand the dynamic i'm not blaming us okay this is the encouragement piece the reminder piece the admonition to not go this route i was sharing with someone i was somebody had a question for me and just kind of sharing their heart with me a few days ago we were talking very much about this weren't we this sort of thing judging salvation Church, I want to encourage you to, to not be like every other Christian. I want to encourage you to be different. We're heritage after all. You got that weird pastor from the south who doesn't fit in up here? This guy that he just like preaches all day and he like gets sweaty and he like yells and he's just weird. Talks funny. He says weird stuff. So we're going to do, I want to ask you to join me on the weirdness wagon. Most Christians, most Christians, I would probably venture to say that most Christians tend to struggle when they don't see God working. It's because they're looking for those monumental things. But God works most in a very subtle, still day-to-day -day way. The example that I used was Mount Rushmore. Think about the carving of Mount Rushmore. Started as a mountainside, the face of a mountain in the Black Hills of South Dakota, right? Anybody ever seen it up close? It's phenomenal. I walked up through that marble gate and went, it was massive. Pictures don't do it justice. You need to go to South Dakota. It's the only thing there. South Dakota is Mount Rushmore and pheasant hunting. I was there pheasant hunting and went and saw it on the way home. I want to encourage you to see it. But think about the process of, of creating Mount Rushmore. You live there. You live in the area. And you see, no, there's changes. 
but you really don't see them until they hit until the the sculpture begins to hit a certain phase of development would you agree are you just I mean you hear the work being done and yeah maybe you see the work being done but there's really nothing you can't see what's being done and then all of a sudden you notice a nose and then there's four noses right and you're like oh but you still don't know who they're going to be are you, you see what I'm getting at the Christian, for Christians, I believe that much of our life is spent focusing on those big monumental moments. And we need to look at the little moments, the little day-to-day -day things, and the little subtle ways that the Holy Spirit works. So maybe you've got a loved one that you, don't, you, you have questioned their salvation. You know, it might just be a simple question that they ask, and they say, hey, I have a question, and it's spiritual in nature. Would that be evidence? To me, it would be evidence of the Holy Spirit working. But we have to be willing to look for those little nuances of Holy Spirit work. Because fruit doesn't start out as an apple, does it? It starts out as a little bitty, but yay big, little bitty green bud. But inside, there's a whole lot of stuff taking place. It's fruit. That's how fruit is developed. So I want to encourage you to be a church. I want to encourage us to be a church that doesn't look for the monumental things. We'll notice those. Amen? But let's be a church that takes time to look for those little finite things, those little finite evidences of the of the power of God being revealed in someone's life. And I promise you that if we can see the little things that God's doing and the fruit being developed and being shaped, like I said, an apple doesn't just, it's spring, apple season. No, no, it takes months. Sanctification takes months. And it's going to take all of eternity that's a lot of months. It takes time, right? It takes time. But I would submit to you that if we would stop looking for the fruit to just appear and we would focus on those little things, verse 1 through 5 would not be an issue for Heritage Baptist Church. Am I wrong? I don't think it would be an issue at all. I'm not saying it's an issue now. I'm just thinking down the road and growth and more people and this could be a problem, right? We've got a very special unity and, and I believe that and you know I believe that. But that doesn't mean we're not prone to falling guilty of some of the lies of the devil. Just because somebody doesn't look the way you think they should look does not mean they're not born again. And if you focus on the little day-to-day -day things that God does, you will praise Him. And you won't worry about what's going on in their life. Remember, it's easy to point out somebody else's shortcomings when we're epically failing. We even teach our kids that, don't we? So what is it in your life? You have a beam? You got a beam hanging out your face? Or just a moat? According to Jesus, the moat's fine. But you're going to have a moat. You're going to have that little irritation from time to time that just gets in the way. But, but he, he, removes the, he removes the beams. Let's be a church that doesn't judge one another. Let's be a church that doesn't question somebody's salvation. Let's be a church that doesn't point the finger. Let's be a church that opens their arms. They're like, I don't care. Come here. I'll love you. I don't care what you were taught growing up. We'll love you. Come over here. I don't care what your priest said. He's a weirdo anyways. We'll love you over here. Our pastor's a weirdo, but... He'll love you. And you don't have to tell him all your problems. Matter of fact, he doesn't want to know. Just, we'll love you. 
What do you say, church? Can we do that? Can we just commit to one another tonight to be in a church that doesn't point the finger but opens the arms? Father, we thank you for this evening and our time together. Father, we ask that you would help us tonight. Father, specifically, we ask that you would help us to meditate on your word, and we thank you for your word. Father, it truly is a blessing. Father, we ask that you would bless this time of invitation. If there's anyone here, Father, that needs to talk with you, speak with you, do business with you, Father, we ask that you would uh, convict them, reveal to them their need to come to you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to ask you to stand to your feet.